So I'd like to welcome you again to this Wednesday meditation gathering. There are people involved with this right now, about 222 people right now online with many more um, who will watch the recording later, as you may also want to do that yourself. And um, actually, I think well over 2,000 who are part of all this and will be coming from time to time. So it's kind of quite something to really appreciate myself, your interest here, and I want to express my own gratitude to you. And I want to say a word about community altogether. It's interesting that um, in the Buddhist tradition, it is said that there are three jewels, three primary refuges, uh, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. The Buddha can be understood as both the historical teacher and the natural wakefulness in ourselves, the Buddha within. Uh, second, the Dharma can be understood as the way it is, reality, and a wise and useful description of reality, such as contained in the teachings of the Buddhist tradition as it's um, evolved and developed over 2,500 years, and certainly other wisdom traditions from around the world, the Dharma. And then we have the Sangha, which can be understood with sort of a vertical dimension of respect for our teachers, including the monastic um, wisdom holders that have kept this tradition alive for 2,500 years. And Sangha can be understood horizontally as the community of fellow practitioners, such as all those who are involved right now. And uh, in an online environment, the good news is that it's a lot easier for a lot of people to come. You know, they don't have to drive uh, to a hall somewhere, which is what I used to do with people in the past. On the other hand, because it's on screen, there's muting, you can't, you know, look at someone nearby and kind of elbow them and like, oh, that was a good point, or whoa, Rick's way out there right now, or something like that. You, know, you can't really do that. Um, so how do we cultivate that sense of togetherness here, which really is a jewel and a support for practice. One way is to practice with other people. I look out and I see some people who are doing this, sitting side by side with others. Uh, I see cats coming in and out who are part of our, our sangha as well. And you might want to do that, you know, once a week, make it a time, at least a few times a month, maybe even weekly, where you gather with your partner or family members or perhaps a friend and you're physically in the same space. Now, since we're sheltering in place and a lot of us are practicing social distancing, you might also want to just arrange with a friend of yours that you're gonna do this together. And um, afterward, you're gonna maybe talk a bit about it or just know that it's in the flow of your week together and it's one of the things that you, you have in common and maybe you, you draw useful wisdom from or some information from. Uh, I really invite you to just tell other people about this if you want and see if they're interested. It's very easy for them to participate. It's free. And um, once they sort of register for it, they'll get a weekly email that actually typically two emails a week, one that tells them that the um, recordings have been posted from the previous group on when, the previous Wednesday and uh, an email that will give them the link for the Wednesday to come. So anyway, that's, an, that's a way to do it. Additionally, we're gonna be looking for ways to do this using the Zoom platform online. One way to do that is for me to, at the end, randomly assign people into small mini Zoom groups. And I can do that with groups of any size. So imagine that as we approach 7.30 Pacific time, quarter, half past the hour, wherever you are, that we finish formally. And then I um, just assign people into groups of three for half an hour, totally voluntary, completely voluntary. And if you don't wanna be in a group, you just sort of can exit. Uh, it's not personal you know, to the other people. You're just not in the mood maybe for it. Yet those who want can form little groups of three and um, can talk with each other uh, and see how it goes. Um, we'll offer some suggestions for making sure that everybody gets their voice in and it doesn't get weird and, and really recognize that you can disengage from a Zoom meeting anytime you want. So with regard to that particular idea, which we're not gonna do tonight, we will not do that tonight, but I wanna get a sense of interest in that. Um, 
if you think about it, how many people would like to try that at least once? And so if you raise your hand, I can then get a sense of hands raised and, you know, well, oh, actually a fair amount of people, particularly the people who are willing to be on video right now, maybe you're a self-selected group, right? The researcher in me would want to acknowledge that. Well, what I'm immediately getting is that we should try this. Great. So we'll try it. And uh, in the venerable tradition of herding cats, uh, I will try to organize it at least a little bit uh, for the safety of people, not to be oppressive. I will not manage it. I will exit. <laughs> I will say, bye bye. <laughs> you know, you're on your own. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> be careful. First of all, do no harm. Okay, that was that was clear. Okay, good. So that's it on the, the sangha part, right? So now, what I'd like to do for about ten more minutes or so, a little more perhaps, is talk about wise effort. And in the Buddhist tradition, there is the eightfold path. It, it has eight. What a surprise! elements to it. And one of those eight elements recommended and offered as by the Buddha for us to see for ourselves what's valuable is what he called wise or right effort. And uh, this is the effort to do two things. On the one hand, to prevent, decrease, or release what is harmful or painful for ourselves and others. And the other effort is to create, protect, and increase that which is beneficial and enjoyable for oneself and others. This, these are the, the wise efforts. What's interesting is to explore the balance of, or the integration of mindfulness and wise or right effort. And I want to apply that as well to this peculiar <laughs> and particular and painful and something or other that starts with the P time that we're living in today with this epidemic that's moving through the world. So um, to be mindful, we must exercise a little effort. Effort is not at odds with mindfulness and our mindfulness enables our efforts to be productive and useful. When we, as in the meditation, enable and encourage effort increasingly to fall away, such as in the instruction to leave your mind alone, let go of the past, let go of the future, let go of the present and leave your mind alone, which is a Tibetan meditation instruction when we're really leaving the mind alone, we start increasingly resting in awareness itself in a state of what's called choiceless awareness. We're not making any choices. We're not making the effort to make any choices. Simply present, Incre increasingly present as presence, as open, boundless awareness. In that stance, or particular state of being, all, little bit mindfulness is present. That's why some people have made the mistake of asserting that the only way to be truly mindful is in the utterly receptive, fairly inert stance of choiceless awareness. That's a mistake. We need to make a little effort to enter into choiceless awareness and to maintain it. And it's really hard to live there when we're driving in traffic or you know, talking to someone while stirring the spaghetti sauce and keeping an eye on the kids in the next room. Uh, as practice matures, increasingly, people are just more and more just kind of hanging out in the present choicelessly, okay. But along the way, efforts needed to be made. And so mindfulness is not at odds with making efforts. The efforts need to be skillful. They need to be wise. They need to be effective and well-considered. And we need to avoid pitfalls, which I know well, of over-striving. I am determined to a fault, right? And I've had to learn to know when it's time to just let go or give up 
or realize that this dog will not hunt. <laughs> this rock will not give water. Uh, this duck will never fly like an eagle or something like that, right? Um, I had to just let it go. The causes and conditions are not present. I'm trying to grow roses heroically, but unsuccessfully in a parking lot. Um, so there's, we have to be careful about, you know, straining and striving and so forth with regard to effort. On the other hand, there are pitfalls in not making efforts enough. And I wanna to speak to several efforts that I think are really important at this time. One is the effort of generosity. Uh, the Buddha strongly emphasized generosity, the word for that in Pali, the language of the early written record of his teachings is dana. So he talked about dana, the dana of attention, giving of attention. You're giving me your attention, you're giving others your attention, we can see what it's like to be generous with people, um, to just give them our attention. I mean, it's kind of remarkable to feel really received by another person for half a minute in a row, which seems like such a small ask, right? Half a minute. And yet, it's kind of startling that they actually were listening to us for half a minute in a row. Well, turn it around. We give others a beautiful gift, generosity, by giving them the gift of our own attention. We give others the gift of restraint. We give them the gift of time. Sometimes we give them different forms of financial contributions, different forms of money. Um, recently, I was, I was gonna be part of a conference um, at Gaia House, actually, in um, England. And um, the conference was canceled due to the coronavirus. And, you know, Gaia House said, you know, if you care to, uh, you know, we'll, we will refund your registration fee, or if you care to offer it as, a, as Donna, to this Buddhist institution there in England, Gaia House, you know, you have a choice. It wasn't a huge amount of money and I wanted to give it to them. Uh, we, we give because it serves our own practice. It serves our practice in the moment of the giving, the release of the open hand, the way it feels good to give, the way that it helps us feel active and potent in some way rather than helpless and overwhelmed, and the ways in which it helps us um, to give out into the world, which eventually gives back. So we give as a major aspect of practice. It, it's appropriate for me as a teacher to call us all, including to call myself, to the practice of generosity, to the wise effort of generosity. You know, it's okay uh, for me to talk about that. And for example, it's, me to, it's okay for me to say, there's a donation button on my website or on the webpage for this um, gathering. And if you care to donate there, I, I welcome that. If you care to donate by sending me an email, as people do, just expressing gratitude uh, or some personal uh, insight you've had or form of growth you've had, I appreciate that. That's your generosity. And to enable your giving, I need to receive. And you know, it, we, uh, we offer a gift to the giver when we receive their generosity ourselves. Uh, occasionally, I even get advice and I try to, I try to be receptive uh, to that as well. So the effort of generosity, a very important one at this time. A second effort these days, I think it's really important, is to let the pitch go by. In other words, to disengage from uh, opportunities that we might have taken the bait for, as it were, in the past, to disengage from wrangles with people that are needless. Um, there are people that I know and love who will give me their infinite wisdom about something or other that I, I ought to do or do differently, or their view about the public health epidemiology at this time, or whatever it might be. And, you know, in the old days, like February, I might argue back. I might argue with them, but these days, there's too much going on. People are under too much pressure. They're scared too, they're stressed too. I don't need to resist it. It doesn't serve the greater good. And so it's my judgment to not be reactive and to let that sail on by. Woof, woof. So just think about the generosity of non-contentiousness, non-contentiousness. This is not walking on eggshells. This is not being a doormat for other people. Wisdom, the wise effort, 
is when to make the effort to actually say something to another person or perhaps calmly mention a fact in passing and then disengage and you know go get some dinner or um, to you know actually speak up uh, it's okay to make those kinds of efforts and to have the wisdom to know when to make them but otherwise to ask ourselves a lot can i disengage from needless contentiousness do i actually need to oppose this view right now will it matter um, if you find yourself like me some from time to time making speeches at the television set <laughs> when you're watching the news <laughs> Once is enough. <laughs> but if you have family members that start to stare at you oddly, maybe that's a signal that, you know, it's kind of invaded you and it's time to disengage. So that's the second wise effort I want to I want to speak to these days, the wise effort of non-contentiousness. I remember many, many years ago reading um, uh, an interview with Ajahn, that's an honorific, he's a monk and in the Buddhist tradition, Ajahn Amaro, a British man, really wonderful teacher. Um, and uh, he, the person asked, I think, what he was practicing with himself these days. And I know Ajahn Amaro, he was on the board with me at Spirit Rock Meditation Center for a number of years. I know him well, deep practitioner, great teacher. I would listen to him anytime. And he said, well, I'm working on not being contentious. And I thought, Ajahn Amaro, quarrelsome, argumentative, contentious. And he went on to say, you know, a lot of that contentiousness is inside my own mind. You know, he might smile calmly or uh, lovingly, but inside, and he was saying he's practicing with non-contentiousness in, inside his own mind. And that, I think, is a second wise effort that's really useful these days. So we don't take on the added burden, the technical term, the added allostatic load of stress burden that comes from you know, contentiousness of any kind. The third wise effort I just want to mention these days is to um, uh, engage the effort of practice. Just practice. Are we practicing with our experiences? Are we practicing with our reactions? Or are we hijacked by them, identified by them, swept away by them, given over to them? Are we giving them power over us or are we practicing in our relationship to them? The anxiety may still be there, the irritation may still be there, the weariness, the pain in your back, the, in my case right now, the sty, actually two, up and down, upper and lower, the sty in your eye. They may be there, but you can practice with it. We can also bring practice to what we do over the course of the day, the mindfulness we bring to what our fingers have touched, uh, to the, you know, how long it's been since, you know, or since we washed our hands, um, the practice we might bring in, in terms of the care we bring to what we say to another person, or the way we deliberately might reach into ourselves to find a genuine love that's not top of mind, but it's there, it's accessible, it's authentic, a genuine love for another person, and to communicate the cherishing of them, the prizing of them, um, our loyalty for them, that's practice. And I recently was on an interview, so I'll just finish on this point, that uh, someone was saying, um, as I was talking about you know, taking in the good or disengaging, given the negativity bias of the brain, Velcro for bad, Teflon for good, disengaging you know, from uh, resentments or anxieties that are, that are not adding any value. And they said, wow, that takes a lot of work. And I just started thinking about it. I thought about ordinary occupations, right? Uh, driving a bus. I so respect bus drivers. Just think about what they're dealing with there. And yet we think hardly of it. They're managing all the traffic. They're dealing with what's going on inside the bus. And, you know, they're doing that eight hours at least a day. And yet for some people, it seems like a really high bar to ask themselves to bring just a little bit of the same competence, the same effort, the same deliberateness as the bus driver might to the external traffic of what's around them and the internal traffic of, or of what's on the bus inside their own mind with them. There's no substitute for a little bit of effort and, and the effort of practice. And you can tell very quickly in this world um, who has practice and who doesn't, who brings practice to bear and who doesn't, 
or more realistically, uh, even um, how rapidly people bring practice online after they kind of ride the first shock of some kind of reaction to something that's arisen externally or, or internally. And that, that's a wonderful thing. And I, I want to end on the notion of the nobility of our practice, uh, just bringing our effort every day so that when you go to bed, um, you look back on your day and you go, yeah, no gold medal necessary, you know, no speech before the UN necessary, no halo necessary, and still good on you. Good for you. You tried, you know, you tried. Good. Buddha encouraged us to find gladness in our goodness because that serves our practice and to make sure that we have a practice that we can be glad about. Okay, so I'd like to open it up for discussion. Uh, for the sake of the greater good, uh, I'm gonna just take a moment here and let this kind of sink in. I'll be kind of quiet for half a minute. And if you would like to ask a question, uh, please raise your hand physically or you can push the little Zoom button, I'll see it. And when you have a question, try to be succinct uh, make sure it's related to what I've talked about tonight. And um, I'll also try to be relatively succinct in my response. So I've talked about the integration of mindfulness and effort and the irreplaceable nature of effort and the three efforts of generosity, non-contentiousness, and practice. Okay, who has a question? And I'll move through the screens and I'll call you and unmute you if I see your hand up. Okay, Barbara, which means Jerry. Yeah, Jerry. Um, I had an incident recently, I was talking with a relative and uh, I was able to disengage but uh, without going into the, the longer story, I was left with a residue of anger and frustration and sadness that this relative was so far out there politically to the point of paranoia and um, it's, it's still hanging around an, an unusually long time. I was wondering if you have any thoughts about how to disengage cleanly as opposed to you know still holding on to uh, that resentment or the sadness and the anger and that kind of stuff. Thank you for saying that, Jerry. And I'll um, make it two general comments and then maybe you have a response to them. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I find both as a longtime uh, psychotherapist as well as someone who's had a lot of creepy crawlers under the rocks in the basement of my own mind you know, from my childhood and young adulthood that periodically gets stirred up myself, right? And also uh, from the Buddhist wisdom. So two keys here. One is to observe whether we are feeding and fueling the reaction at all. That's very important. And if the answer is yes, then the next question becomes, okay, can I stop doing that? <laughs> you know, can I make the effort, the wise effort, to release that negative feeding, following, preoccupying, and you know, and fueling of that material? And can I also make the wise effort of shifting my attention to something else? Including, as, as you know from my material, looking for the something else that is a natural kind of antidote or resource for the, for the particular need or issue that was stirred up by that other person. So for example, if that other person, let's say stirs up fears that they're gonna do things that will hurt you or others you care about, then reaching for resources for anxiety, such as calm strength, feeling protected, a realistic appraisal of the scale of the threats and so forth, that would be matched. Or it could well be that there's um, a kind of uh, interpersonal wounding, a sense of feeling dismissed or disrespected or kind of like cut off almost. Like, 
other people these days sometimes have views that can feel as if they're, uh, we are exiled from any possibility of a reasonable interaction with them. And that sense of exile can be quite painful and it can even stir up old feelings of exile that are interpersonal, right? Feeling dismissed and, and shoved away and devalued, you know, and the language narcissistic injury. So the naturally matched supplies or experiences for that would be things like feeling worthy already uh, feeling loved by others, befriended by others, a part of a gathering like this of, of sane and friendly people, right? Uh, who, as Suzuki Roshi put it, are both perfect and could use some improvement, me included. So, um, you know, that's natural. So that's a first key question with practice, you know, am I feeding and, fo and following this? If, if often the answer is no, and the material is just there, including different kinds of situations where we grieve losses or we're just frustrated by being cooped up or deprived of familiar activities, like taking a thoroughbred who wants to run and, and just trapping it in a small stall. You know, it's naturally going to be affected by that. But that's, that's the first dart or the first arrow of life, as the Buddha taught. The key question is, am I adding my own reactivity to it that's creating the second darts? First question. Second question, even when we stop feeding and fueling it, and it still is hanging around, it's often useful to ask, what's deeper? What's underneath this? What's the deeper wound? What's the younger longing? What's the more intimate or vulnerable hurt? Is there something underneath it all that this is stirred up because when we do all the right things, you know, the skillful, wise efforts, and that, I'm gonna use the metaphor, the weed in the garden of the mind is still rooted somehow, we, we probably haven't yet gotten in touch with, mindfully, with complete um, vulnerability with ourselves, with the deepest tip of the root of that material. So that can be very, very useful to sense down to that. And these, if you'll observe it, are efforts, aren't they? The effort to disengage from habits of feeding and following and preoccupation. Resentment is like taking poison and waiting for others to die, right? As the saying has it. Um, that takes effort. It takes effort to shift attention elsewhere. It takes effort to deliberately kind of evoke and then internalize resources that are matched to the problem takes effort to help oneself to uncover and bear and feel the deeper material and to experience it out, to allow it to flow through one out the door. That takes effort as well. It's practice. It's okay. That's part of our practice to do this. Um, there's more to practice than simply witnessing the stream of consciousness, as profoundly important as that is. Okay? So so I feel like I've just kind of stopped. So this gives me some impetus to go ahead with the exploration. So that yeah. Good. Yeah, I encourage you to do that. Okay, good. Thank you, Jerry. All right. All right. Next person, anybody else have a comment or question so far? I'm going to keep scrolling through. through. Ole. Ole. Uh, hello, Ole. Someone who gives me lots of good comments and feedback because he's generous. Thank you. Thank you kindly for that. Um, Observations, I found when the creepy crawlies and the nasty stuff come up, the two very powerful tools I have are forgiveness and self-compassion. Great. Um, then the other thing that came up when a really big bump in the road comes along rather than, if I may fall flat my face on it, but if, keep chipping away at it, like you said, put some perspective out there look at it. It's kind of like untangling a big ball of twine. Just keep pulling at it. And yeah, it might take time, but it, it seems to work. And is that on track kind of with? Oh, yeah, that's an uncovering. Uh, you know, I, I, the Buddha was, I mean, I'm a writer and I try to write at least. And the Buddha was amazing with language. He used so many metaphors. And one of one of his metaphors recurrent is the idea of disentangling. Just like you said, Oli. Oh, thank okay, you. great. So I'm gonna move on then to see if there's maybe a question out there. How about you, Sophia? I'm unmuting you, yeah. Hi, hi Rick, I'm so happy to talk to you. Um, 
I, my, my, I was just wondering whether or not you had any thoughts on the, um, the effort of non-contentiousness when um, you're, you're working with somebody who has a tendency to lean towards perfectionism um, and the battle that kind of goes on within. Um, and it's something that, well, I, I'm somebody who suffers from <laughs> perfectionism. I'm, I'm finding um, I'm having some real difficulty during this period of time where, you know, I'm, I'm doing limited work from home and, you know, and then trying to fit in all of these wonderful classes that are available and everything and not being able to do everything perfectly. So that battle in my head, you know. Oh yeah, well, thank you very much, Sophia. And if I understand it correctly, in, in myself, uh, I'm a recovering duoholic, right? And it's, mm -hmm. it's very hard for me to not do something excellently, at least if I can, right? Uh, and uh, so, you know, in some ways I can relate to what you're saying, and I'm sure I have at least one of the 10 genes for OCD. I don't know if they're 10 <laughs> or 11 or nine, but something like that. So, all right, here's an interesting thing. Question is, what is the perfectionism trying to keep at bay? In other words, to what extent are we being lived by healthy aspirations toward being impeccable and, you know, shaping something into beauty or making sure that just something, something is simply done properly, right? That all the hatches are battened down, you know, that the door is locked when we leave. To what extent is there that which has a nobility in it and a beauty even versus to what extent are these perfectionistic efforts a strategy to keep anxiety at bay? Or That's as in my, my strategy. <laughs> yeah, okay. Or as in my case, given my fault finding upbringing from the outside, yes. um, to preempt any possibility of criticism coming my way, right? Yes. That's a different, yeah, that's a different collection of motivations. So then the art often is to disengage from the old machinery while shifting our motivations again and again and again. It takes a while to develop this new habit, this new motivational habit, right? Uh, so that increasingly we are being lived on the basis of these motivations, these aspirations that feel contented already. They're not based on craving, right? The, uh, the, the effort that's driven by anxiety or threat, including the preempting of the social threat of criticism, Mm -hmm. of, you know, from others and all that might follow, you know, that's based, that's a form of craving. That's an, right. that's based on an aversion to the unpleasant uh, or the chasing of social supplies, let's say, narcissistic rewards from others. That's not so good. That's second noble truth life. <laughs> you know, that's life right. from the red zone. The alternative is to live life more and more from the green zone, from, you know, a growing sense of the third noble truth, the cessation of craving-based motivations and living more, in effect, as Maslow talked about it, uh, shifting from, he called them D needs, deficiency-based needs, the, the mm -hmm. lower four, and shifting more and more into B needs, he called them being needs that are based on self-actualization. Right. That's a major shift, and this is a very important way to understand effort. When I see people who are deeply committed to practice, uh, both lay people and monastics, they make efforts, you know, they are, you know, impeccable, they sweep the temple floor, they chop the carrots carefully, they tend to the sick, they uh, demonstrate in the streets, they speak truth to power, they bring effort to bear. They study, they learn languages, they bring those efforts to bear. But much of the time, uh, there's a sense of inner lightness and joy as if they are lived by their practice, they're lived by the inspiration of their practice, rather than a contracted scratching and clawing up the mountaintop. And that's an enormous shift and it's really useful to observe. Do we wash the dish out of fear or joy? Do we uh, fold the clothes out of a grim sense of duty or to make sure they don't criticize us or for the 
for the experience itself or the opportunity to, to be mindful while doing something physical or for the beauty of the folded t-shirt. I love folding my t-shirts. They look <laughs> so good when I'm all done. You know, <laughs> what is our basis? Same action, but so different because it's coming from a different wellspring inside. Okay, so thank you, Sophia. I'm gonna finish up now uh, okay, because it is- Thank you very you know, much. Oh, my pleasure. Sorry, Bill uh, and others, I'm gonna end on time. But what I'd like to do first though, is what we used to do when we met physically, is to just sit together for a minute in silence to let whatever is useful today, tonight, to sink in. And then I'll unmute everyone so we can say goodbye to each other for a last minute. And then I'll ring the bell three times and we'll finish. I think it's sink in. And if I can offer one suggestion for your practice this week, actually, it is to find gladness in your goodness. Exploring the wise effort of finding gladness in your goodness. It takes a certain courage, even a nobility, to name at least to yourself and if appropriate to others, a gladness in your goodness. I myself experience much gladness in your goodness, truly. <laughs>